Today, I want to talk about language agnostic BERT sentence embeddings, which is also commonly abbreviated as LABASE. The idea is that I'm interested in constructing a transformer-like model that can accept input from any language. We're trying to look for something that is indeed agnostic. And the reason why we're interested in this is because if we think about the conversational setting that we see online, then even if you're speaking in, let's say, Dutch, you will very commonly see Dutch being used together with English. And it's not just happening in Dutch, it's happening to a whole bunch of languages. So if we're able to have as input text from any language and get a useful representation out over here, then that will be very useful indeed. So in this video, I'm going to explain the results from the language agnostic BERT sentence embedding paper. Let's say I've got this transformer block. And it's a transformer like we've seen in previous videos. It is the encoder block from the attention is all you need paper. Then what's happening is I've got text which is turned into tokens. Typically these are subtokens, which in turn are turned into embeddings, fed to a transformer, and the idea is that the embeddings that come out on the other side are contextualized. If you want to learn something in such a system, though, you need something of a label. So what you can do as a pre-processing step is you can say, well, if I'm going to have some weights that are useful in this transformer, let's see if we can predict a token that's missing. During the training procedure, we might be able to remove some tokens from our original text, and then we can see if we can predict the missing token. If we make an error here, we get a gradient update, which should be able to update any of the weights that are in this transformer. If I'm going to do this though, I will need to think a little bit about these tokens. After all, I'm going to be passing lots of text from different languages through this thing. So these tokens are not going to represent words. They will be representing subwords instead. The paper describes that they are using 500,000 of these subword tokens. Now, these subtokens, they are generated by using the word piece procedure, which is a bit of a detail that I'll ignore in this video, but it's very much like the byte pair encoding, which you might have seen in the earlier video in this series. However, for all of these separate subwords, we are generating these contextualized embeddings at the end, and we have a training procedure by masking that is able to come up with sensible weights for the transformer here. All of this though, is a pre-processing step. The idea is that we're going to be taking this transformer with the weights that we've learned using these subtokens and masking, and we're going to use this transformer for another task. What I'll do is I'll take this pre-trained transformer and I'll copy it. I'm going to initialize a transformer over here, as well as over here. And I'm even going to couple these two transformers in a sense that they will have the same weights. And they're also both initialized by the same pre-processing procedure I just mentioned. What I can now do though, is I can now say, well, I can have input text go through the first encoder, and I can have target text go through the next one. Then what I can have is I can have a representation going out here, not for all the separate tokens, but instead for the entire input text. I can apply, I can apply some pooling here. So I would have a vector on both sides. And what I'm now able to do is I'm able to take both of these vectors and I could come up with some sort of similarity loss. Because the idea could be that I can have a sentence going in here that's written in English, but maybe I also have a translation over here in Dutch. And if I have the appropriate data set, I can come up with a bunch of tasks where I'm supposed to pick the best translation out of a given set. And this will again give me a feedback signal 
that I can learn from, which again will update the transformers here. And note that these two transformer blocks that are drawn here share the same weights. So effectively, we can still regard this as a single transformer that we're updating. It's just that we have two language as inputs, so that's why we have two blocks drawn here. And I hope that you appreciate that this trick is kind of interesting because we're learning something general across different languages. First of all, we have our pre-processing procedure here where the transformer should be able to learn from all sorts of texts and not necessarily know which text it is from. And in the procedure that we have over here, we are actively giving labels that are related to translations. So given enough data and enough training, we might be able to come up with a language agnostic representation. Now, this will only work if you do this on a big data set for a lot of epochs, and if you have the ability to throw a lot of compute at this problem, which is exactly what the authors at Google did. And I can quote the paper that for certain steps in this learning procedure, there were 1.8 million epochs that they used to train everything here. Luckily for us though, we don't have to do this training procedure ourselves. And instead what we can do is we can take a pre-trained model and interface with that. So one thing that I have done is I have made this model available in what lies. So what I'll do now is just quickly highlight some of the features by playing directly with this language agnostic model. So what I've got here is a Jupyter notebook with what lies loaded. And I'll be comparing the language agnostic model with the universal sentence encoder. Now note that this universal sentence encoder that I'm loading in has only been trained on English. If I scroll down and have a look at this chart that I'm making, then you should see some clusters appear. The texts that I have here contain clusters mixed in three different languages. Ik vind honden leuk, I really like dogs, me gusta los perros, they mean the same thing, but the first sentence is Dutch, the second sentence is English, and the third one is Spanish. What this language agnostic model seems to capture is indeed that there are clusters here and that there should be something of a similarity. And I would argue that it's doing a pretty good job at that. Now I hope that you look at this and consider how useful this might be in a multi-language setting. Even if you have trained an assistant with data in English, and if you are using this technique as a featureizer, then chances are that your assistant will be able to interpret messages in a few other languages out of the box without needing to retrain. If I were now to compare this to the universal sentence encoder though, you will see that the universal sentence encoder is having a very bad time. It's certainly no surprise. After all, this model has only been trained on English. But I hope it is immediately clear that in a multi-language setting, this model wouldn't perform very well. Now, if I'm thinking about use cases and why this particular embedding might be very interesting, is the fact that it seems that if we have an English sentence and we just replace one word with a translation, I really like dogs, I really like perros, I really like honden, they can still be clustered together, even though I am mixing two languages in a single sentence. And the same thing happens with money, dinero, and health. And the reason why this is particularly interesting is because a lot of internet language these days is a mix of slang and multiple languages mixed together. I live in the Netherlands, but when I am texting friends, I'm also using some English vocabulary here and there. And that's because sometimes I'm using hashtags or references to things that are international. And therefore, a model that's language agnostic can be incredibly useful because it's plausibly more robust against this internet language phenomenon. Now, if you're interested in trying this model out, know that in Raza, we now support these language model featureizers directly. And if you scroll in the documentation, you will find that 
there is a pre-trained model that you can configure if you're interested in trying out these embeddings. If you're dealing with a non-English language or if you're dealing with a multi-language setting, then this might certainly be an experiment worth doing. When you're experimenting with this technique, do keep one thing in mind though. This language agnostic BERT model is still very compute intensive. You might notice that it will slow down your machine learning pipeline if you use it. So be sure to keep an eye on that. Having said all this though, I should mention that there is one more use case for these embeddings that I haven't discussed yet. You might remember from this playlist that I had this bulk labeling demo. The idea was to take text, pass it through a language model, and then use a dimensionality reduction technique to plot it in 2D. This might give us clusters on a 2D plane where we might draw as well. For example, I can draw a cluster here, get a preview of all the points in this cluster, and the idea is that I can then assign a name to it. This cluster is all about time, for example. And a cluster over here seems to be about jokes. I can click redraw, and the clusters are now gone, and I can continue on labeling this data set of intents. And the reason why this is a relatively effective technique is because I've got a language model at my disposal that knows how to cluster these together. Before though, I will be using the universal sentence encoder for this embedding, but because this language agnostic model is now implemented in what lies, that also means that I have 109 languages potentially at my disposal that I can label using this bulk labeling technique. Note that you don't have to use what lies. The language agnostic BERT model is also readily available in TensorFlow Hub and in Hugging Face. But having said that, the reason why I'm so enthusiastic about this particular technique is because usually the quality of your training examples is what's causing your assistant to work. It's not necessarily the model, rather the labels that the model learn from. And having a general non-English technique at our disposal to help us with labeling should help out a lot of people who are starting to make their first virtual assistant. So if you're interested in exploring this, just remember to give this language agnostic model a try.